The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're now listening to Greg. It's the Brothers Wisp. Let's take hey everybody, a this is Greg with the Brothers Wisp number 158. I am coming to you from the motherland here in Texas. As always, it's been pretty nice weather. Pretty pretty balmy, pretty enjoyable. But uh, speaking of enjoyable weather, we have with us uh, a new face that hasn't been on the podcast before, and that is Zach Biles. Hey everybody. Uh, where are you from, Zach? I am from northern Minnesota. Uh, most people would say Canada, but not quite. That's gotcha. a cold, south. white north. You said it just snowed again, right? Yeah, it just got about four inches the other day, so we're uh, we're still white. Oof, duh. All right. We also have Tommy Krugen, T Cent, although he is not from Colorado. All of a sudden, yeah, I've been I've been uh, transplanted to the. Uh, State of Illinois. I, I can't even say great because no one else will say great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could start a trend, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The trendsetter. Uh, I heart IL. Something like that. That'd be funny. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't have quite the same ring, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, yeah. Excellent. Well, two very happy faces all of a sudden. I mean, you guys are real downers today. No, no, no I'm just kidding. Uh, so let's see. Let's uh, let's get the uh, the little stuff out of the way. And by little stuff, I'm talking about uh, our patrons. So we have Patreon, patreon.com forward slash brothers whiz. And this go around, we have an unnamed Frenchman. He didn't want to be called out by name, uh, but a uh, pretty interesting guy. He's moved around a lot. And uh, he was kind enough to throw us a few bones so we could get access to the Patreon-only Slack. And I would encourage you to do so as well. Having said that, we have a couple of other sponsors. Our Tried and True, brought to you by Sonar, a scalable, intuitive, and comprehensive ISP and operational support system. You can learn more by going over to sonar.software. We also have Tower Coverage. So Tower Coverage is your RF propagation system to empower your network, real-time data metrics, enable your coverage area, reach your customer base, and more. The industry's best RF propagation mapping system allows website integration for customer signup and pre-qualification. Use this data to scientifically plan network expansion and help your WISP succeed. Get a free trial today at towercoverage.com. All right. So <clears throat> I know... Tommy's been up to a lot of stuff lately, and Zach, I don't know what he's been doing, but uh, I've uh, been learning a little bit more about Git, and that is G-I-T, not G-E-T. Although I've been talking about Git so much in the last like couple of few months that I always type when I'm typing stuff. It's I'll go back and I'll look and I've typed G-I-T. So it's permeated my brain in unfortunate ways, and it's version control stuff, and I'm guessing 90% of the folks listening to this don't have to deal with it but i did find i just wanted to put it out there i did find a really good resource for teaching you git in kind of a visual way it's this little online system that you can kind of go through and i've got a little link right there in the thing you think so if you are trying to get a little bit better about using git this is a nice way to at least understand the basics they actually use pictures and like these moving graphics and stuff that as you're going through the labs they adjust and it kind of helps you visualize what's happening otherwise it's this uh, sort of weird amorphous thing that's hard to put your brain around. Uh, so uh, what else have I worked on lately? Uh, the Arista ZTP uh, Zero Touch Provisioning blog post is done. I've got it up. I've already thought of kind of a 2.0 version of that. So if you guys were curious about that, you could pop in and take a look. Um, uh, I'm going to run it across some customers next week. We'll see if I uh, made any boo-boos. So... <laughs> We'll see if they call me out on that. So, like, I've used Git for just general, like, code hosting. And that's, like, the extent of my knowledge and such. And I've muddled my way through, uh, like, uploading stuff to Git and downloading stuff from Git. Um, what would you say would be, like, in a general WISP environment, maybe... Is there use cases for it that would be outside of like, hey, I have a big code project? 
Oh man, I am probably the last person to ask about this stuff. So okay. I, I use Git probably in a very similar fashion. So I do a lot of animation now and really I keep all of my playbooks, right? All of my recipes, all of my scripts inside of a Git repository for a couple of reasons. One is it's a nice, well, I use um, GitHub and it's, you know, it's free. You can have public repos, which is what I put all my stuff in in public, or you can have private ones that are just for you and uh, it's a good place to kind of centrally store your files. Everybody can get to them, but also it does um, version control on it. So you can go back in time and see all the changes that were made, right? It'll do a diff between today and yesterday or today and six months ago. So you can mm -hmm. kind of really easily see what happened over time. I mean, for, the, for me, that's a really good one. <clears throat> I also use it for storing my backups. So mm -hmm. my network equipment, I'll throw the backups in there. So again, it's like really good long-term retention on that stuff, but also it shows me the things that changed in my backups, right? And you can set alerts in there so that if your backup does change, it'll send you a notification like, oh, hey, this thing adjusted. And so okay. it's it's clever in that it only will like upload the differences between files, right? So if I have a file and only one line changed, it's really only going to update that one line. So. Git, I don't think people traditionally put a lot of really thick files, you know, like binaries and stuff in there. Um, but theoretically, if you have a really big file, it's not going to transfer the whole thing. It'll really just kind of transfer those differences. So mm -hmm. it can be kind of efficient for that. Um, but I guess ultimately it was really devised for uh, kind of code repository things. So people working on, uh, you know, some kind of application and you have multiple people working out, everybody has an identical copy of it on their kind of local machine or whatever it is. And uh, the way you can all collaboratively work on projects and then push those into the repository. Uh, another cool thing is I see people do um, kind of their change control through it, right? So if you've got like, here are my network changes I want to make, you know, you can like try and push them into the repository or you do like a merge request is what it's called sometimes. Like I want to merge these mm -hmm. in. And so somebody else has to approve that first, right? So it's kind of belt and suspenders. You created it, you you think it looks good, and then you have somebody else put their eyes on it and make sure that they think it looks good first before they allow you to commit that. So that could be part of your change control. So we see people do that a lot too. So there's, I don't know, kind of a yeah. lot of different avenues for utilization. There was actually, there's, um, I'm trying to find who it was because you, you were mentioning that and that, that reminded me, I actually, there's a guy who wrote some stuff about Microtik and he was like trying it out for the first time. And some of his config was goofy that he was posting online and it was related to the 2004, the first one that came out. And, um, uh, I, I like was going through his configs and I was like, oh, Hey, there's some goofiness. Like you definitely wouldn't want to do this, that, or the other thing. It wasn't probably the core reasons why he ended up deciding that it wasn't a good thing. But I, I messaged him and I got access to his Git, which he hosts his website through Git. And you can update our articles and stuff. And uh, so I've publicly helped stuff and in, uh, updated that. So it was a really cool concept and idea. And I was like, oh, that's, that's actually like brilliant in my opinion. So I'm hoping uh, before the end of this, I will, because he had a lot of other cool uh, network related commentary and just hardware goofing around stuff. I want to say Zach it. made an update to one of my repositories, didn't you? Yeah, a long, long time ago. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm using it, you know, for backups, kind of like Greg's doing, but uh, also for kind of like default configuration scripts, right? You know, if, if you got Kind of your default setup you want on every router or switch or you know you know network device everybody can you know merge those changes together and then you have access to it wherever and then when you sync that down to your local pc and it, you know you bring that to a customer site and you're setting up a new piece of equipment and you forgot to grab the config you've got the default there and can go through and you know just change change the variables in that in that script apply it to the device and you're you know, off and running because you have that local copy as long as you've synced, you know, your, your most recent changes, but yeah, that's how I'm kind of using it now. And on top of kind of the coding stuff, you know, into some of the automation and, and whatnot as well, but just kind of a more basic, you know, maybe WISP type, you know, solution there um, would be 
yeah, put your default configurations in there, put your, you know, even documentation, uh, you know, same kind of change control. You know, every time you update your documentation, somebody's reviewing that before it's actually going live. And uh, they're, you know, writing in, in Markdown is is really slick. So we'll post so that really well. What would you what would you say to the people that say, um, we just have a file share that we keep our default configs in? Like, what do you feel is advantageous about doing that and kind of a Git repo as opposed to just sticking it out somewhere like on a file server? To me, it's the the that change tracking, right? Every time you make a change, hey, who, who made this change? Because it broke, you know, X, Y, Z in your, you know, default config. Um, you know, trying to figure out who did it, go look through audit logs and things like that versus being able to just pull it up in a, you know, side-by-side -side window and have it, okay, this, these are the exact lines that change. These are the exact, you know, characters that changed. And, you know, that person's name's tagged right on there too. So, you know, really quickly be able to see, hey, you made this change, go talk to them. Hey, why, why'd you make this change? You know, was it, you know, something <laughs> that needed to happen or whatever, you know, it, it broke some stuff, so let's fix it. Um, you know, it, it can sometimes have some bad connotations of, you know, pointing the finger, but, you know, it's usually not the intent, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like how you put it there. Just ask the person, what was the, what was the intent behind this change? Like, why are, why are we switching directions? Why do we do that? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Something else that popped into mind is that we see some of our customers do it kind of in the enterprise and I do it on a demo or two. And we actually successfully use it in our lab is, um, people call it like GitOps, where you have something called a webhook. So in one of my repositories, if I make an adjustment to a file and that gets merged, then it calls something called a webhook. So it's really just connecting into my Ansible infrastructure. So it like, as soon as I save it, it calls into my Ansible infrastructure and says, Hey, this file changed. And so it really kicks off a piece of automation that you can have do kind of anything. And so one of mine is it spins up um, basically a whole new application. So I'm doing like in my little demo, I'm doing like a, a web server. So you update this HTML page in the Git repository. What calls the automation, the automation spins up a new, you know, VM installs the web services, gets everything up, gets the web page on there, updates the load balancer. And then once all the traffic's successfully switched to there, it kills the old one. So it kind of like, will migrate you in applications. That's sort of interesting, but probably not what most of the people listening to this utilize, but we also use it for um, kind of infrastructure as code. The idea that our border router in our lab, we never like log into it anymore. And it's a micro tick in our lab. And so if you want to update a firewall rule, you want to update a NAT or a DNS setting, something like that, we have these files in our Git repository, you just make an update to that and it calls the automation platform. It'll take those configurations and item potently, the idea being if it needs to make a change, it will, it'll connect to the router and it'll look at your firewall rules and say, does everything match the state I've defined here? If it does, it doesn't do anything, just goes about its day. If there's an update, like I need to remove something, or I need to add something, well, it'll go through and it'll do that for you and then complete. So in all honesty, we almost never touch that device unless I'm going to do a little troubleshooting. I'll pop in there and look at it. Other than that, all the people in our environment, all the guys using our shared lab, they want a firewall rule. They make uh, they make a you know a merge request on that file. Somebody else will look at it, say yeah, it looks good. As soon as they commit it, boom! It the automation connects into the infrastructure, makes all the adjustments. So we definitely have change control in our environment, like on our actual hardware just based on that and you can just pop in there and really easily look in the files and see who made what changes when and you know all that cool stuff so i think to add a, another piece to that is having the ability to have sanity checks before it gets pushed right so if somebody makes a merge request even if you have another set of eyes maybe they miss something mm -hmm. have that kind of basic set of sanity checks in an automated fashion to look at the config and hey is this going to break anything and you get into all kinds of things like Batfish and all those other uh, frameworks that you can use and kind of protect you from yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. For, so Batfish, I actually looked at that for a little bit. They do have an enterprise product, but I looked at it about a year ago and it wasn't fully baked, the enterprise, but they do have the open source version. Um, and what Zach's referring to is it will take all of the kind of like show runs off your equipment 
and you could say, hey, I'm going to make this adjustment. After I make this change, I need to make sure that connectivity for ping or I need TCP port 443 to be able to go from, you know, X point to Y point in my network. And so it will just look at the configurations and based on the input you gave it, right? Like these are the changes I'm going to make. And this is the testing. It'll go through and check, oh, is this all going to work? You know, so um, it's not like spinning up VMs or anything like that. And, you know, like a GNS3 and trying to build all that. It's, it kind of um, natively can interpret the configuration settings and know like in the device whether this is going to work and stuff like so it's pretty it's pretty neat i saw they were they were talking about how some like financial institutions use it right to ensure that you know there's not going to be any downtime or whatever and I, I think that could be a pretty good cya like as an engineer because those guys are so tightly controlled on how much i think they can have they're allowed like maintenance wise or something like one of the companies they were talking about gets like 45 minutes a month of maintenance window of late downtime, which is insanity, right? So if you somehow are the person that screwed that up, I mean, you know, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, so, well, I mean, probably a bad month because they probably don't get that many change windows if, mm. you know, that's the only downtime you're allowed. Uh, so Batfish being able to kind of double check your work definitely, you know, it's like a sanity check, uh, mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. And so if Batfish doesn't catch it, you can say, well, I mean, you know, what do you expect? You know, all the tools said it was good, so but it's only as good as what you put in there. Right. I mean, if you don't yeah. define all the conditions that you want, well, so yeah, it still takes a little bit of work. Yeah. But their enterprise product was shaping up pretty cool. I'm, I should probably revisit it to see how far they've come along. They were um, adding some really good API integrations, right? So that, you know, one piece of software can talk to it. And ultimately that's what you want your automation to be able to do is just seamlessly talk to this thing. Um, it was a pretty, uh, pretty neat product. We'll see uh, how it ends up in the end. It only supported most of your major manufacturers though. At the time it was like your Cisco, your Junipers, maybe Arista and I think some firewalls. I can't hundred percent remember. Definitely no MicroTik support in there. Last time I looked anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, that reminds me of another bit of software um, from Netting Labs. It's open source, but the idea is to give you a network-wide like control panel and vendor agnostic. Um, and it's called S-U-Z-I-E-Q. Um, and it like, you can see like, okay, here's all the connectivity of various things. And then also like say, okay, I want peering between these things. And I want to see like, uh, like changes, what, what like BGP advertisements were on this router at this time versus now, or like, you know, when it has this route changed and how did it change and when did it change? So it'll do all that stuff. Doesn't have MicroTik support yet, but I was looking and it doesn't look like it would be completely impossible to add it in um, if I ever have time to figure out <laughs> all their stuff. But it's a really cool project, and they're um, they've been working really hard on it. And I don't know where they're getting their money from, but they've um, they've they've got a couple developers working on it pretty consistently, and they're doing some pretty cool stuff with network monitoring and network configuration in a centralized fashion. It's really cool. That is cool. What was it called again? It's from Netting Labs, Net in Labs. Um, they are notable for doing some really fast uh, BGP blog posts, and the project is S-U-Z-I-E-Q. How would you pronounce that? I call it Suzy Q, but they have um, their own pronunciation. I'm certain that there's a pronunciation for it. I think um, no matter what it is, I prefer Suzy Q as well. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there's some reference to a song is what I was reading in their documentation somewhere, but that was completely irrelevant to the project and what it does. Um, and uh, yeah, completely agentless uh cisco stuff arista juniper um 
normalize that data into a vendor agnostic format. So, nice. which is kind of cool to me. And then, uh, then they um, allow some sort of analysis and such like that. I haven't paid attention to it in, in a month or so. So uh, they've got some newer features and, and newer re- releases with cool stuff. So, um, you know, if you're a Cisco Juniper shop, maybe take a look and see if, you know, what they're doing could be something really useful for you. Um, Cumulus, Palo Alto. Okay. That I think that's new, uh, Sonic devices and Linux. Um, so just really cool stuff. And, you know, with all these different things, like Microtech's going to have a lot of that. I think the only thing we really need to figure out is a way to and like say hey this route has changed or has been removed is is what i was rem- is what i'm remembering but it's a really cool project um and what they're working on to uh, make better i will put a link to their stuff um uh in the show notes yeah, for really sure. Quick. So I think Batfish does something similar. It takes those configurations mm-hmm. and puts them in kind of a vendor agnostic format so that it can crunch it in the engine. You know, mm-hmm. somebody was telling me maybe two days ago uh, about a system called, and I think they called it Cisco Pits, like P-I-T-S or something similar to that. And mm-hmm. it's supposed to be, uh, I think they open source it. It's supposed to be kind of like an equivalent to Batfish. Or I guess this Suzy Q system as well. I did some Googling. I couldn't find it. And I was like, hey, man, when you figure that out, you send me a link to it. And they haven't sent me a link yet. But um, it sounds like yet another uh, alternative to uh, to that. Everybody's trying to solve the same problem, I guess. I mean, well, if you have hundreds or even thousands of routers that you have to maintain um, across a network, like there's so many things to keep track of. Um, uh, I have a uncle who works for Bank of America and does their VM stuff. And um, like inventory is his first and last thing that he says that you need to be a master of to d- do your job well in technology. Like you have to know what you what you have, what you can provide, and what's available um, at any time. And being able to do that and say, hey. Somebody comes to you and says, I want X, Y, Z. And you can go, do, 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 do. Well, Y and Z are possible. X is not because of this, this, and this. Like, that's makes or breaks what you can do. Um, and he has to deal with their networking department. And the networking department won't even know, like, what, uh, how many ports they have available on a switch. And he's like, just figure out how to, like, what you have and where it is because then you can solve a lot of your problems for your business. Yeah, that's so funny that you say that. Like a lot of the customers we talk to, you know, because we're trying to talk to them about automation. It's like, well, one of the key steps of automation is to know the list of your equipment you're going to automate against. It's like, well, what are you guys using for your CMDB? You know, your configuration management database, some system that's maintaining the list. And like, oh, well, you know, over here on the network team, they kind of will scan it with their network thing. And then over here, we're looking at our vCenter and our corporate policy is to use the ServiceNow CMDB, but nobody really updates that. And, you know, so it's, yeah, it's usually uh, very trying, but if everybody can like corporate policy, you settle on one place. And then uh, for me, like what I always, like I even wrote some automation that does it for me. Like I'll take my monitoring system that's dynamically discovering stuff, doing a great job of that. And I use Ansible to pull that out of my monitoring system and shove it into the CMDB. It's like, oh, I'm technically adhering to the corporate policy. So no big deal. I may not use it, but I'm shoving all my stuff in there just in case you need to audit, right? Like because auditors mm-hmm. are going to come through or, you know, compliance reasons, like all that stuff is there. Yeah. And it, like, and that being a way to like centralize point for like, hey, this is what is happening in the network. This is who made these changes. Because a lot of hardware doesn't have change management built in. Like, Microtik doesn't really, like, you know, user logged in, user made change to firewall rule. Um, you know, you can add in stuff, um, but 
it's really difficult. And so really paying attention to that, hey, heck, even a lot of the old Cisco and Juniper hardware like that our guys would be using, you, know, you root logged in well, and made X, Y, Z changes. Well, who was root or whatever? Like you, you really do need to have some level of finding this. And even if it's a pain in the neck and it's a stupid system, like well, what you're doing, pushing to it and you know, you have your own, but pushing to the company policy, like it's, it's just going to make somebody else's life so much better um, to the point of, you know, it's, it's basic human charity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, for me, I, I look at the world through completely different uh, set of lenses than I used to, because to me, it's always automation first, you know? So I want to do it manually the first time to figure out how to do it. And then, Time number two, I'm going to be automating, you know, so I just always look through that lens. And if I don't have a list of everything, I, you know, how am I, how am I going to automate this stuff? Or if I don't have consistent access to all this stuff, how am I going to automate? You know, um, if I have people willy nilly going out there and touching equipment, like you said, and I don't know what they're doing, it's like, well, you can't always automate in those environments because maybe the automation is going to overwrite something they just put in. You know, or we talk to people who want to do um, drift management on their configurations, right? So every night at 3 a.m., they want their automation to go through and look at, you know, the Git repository, the configurations, and check all of the network equipment and make sure that it's in the state defined over here, right? So if anybody went in on the, the CLI and made a change, they wanted to fix that, right? Because that's, that's not policy. You shouldn't be that way. Um, and to those people, I say, well, yes, you can schedule that. It's right here. Schedule, done. I mean, it's really that simple. But are you sure you want to do that? I was like, because at 1 a.m. when something breaks and you guys, you know, your your team is in there and they're duct taping things back together and they're rerouting around and they'll just get it settled and functional so that when they come in the next morning, everything will be okay. And your automation goes through and just wipes all that out. I was like, are you sure that's what you want to have happen? It's like... No, man, when people are in break fix, you need to just leave it alone. So I, I'm very much an advocate of in those scenarios, at least on the network equipment, just send me an alert that there has been drift, right? That it doesn't match. Don't actually do remediation unless I tell it to. So there's some levels of automation that I, it's, you know, it, to me, it makes sense to, in some scenarios to let the automation have, you know, full control of everything and sometimes not. Well, when would you say would be the time where, the automation should have full control. I see that more on um, kind of application server infrastructure stuff. You know, like um, when you're enforcing security policies on your servers, you know, if somebody turns off SE Linux while they're testing something, you probably want your automation to go through and hit that checkbox and, oh, they cranked that off, let me turn that back on, right? If, if they're doing weird stuff like that, that should be in the dev environment, not in production. You know, it shouldn't be. In theory, a lot of our customers treat their systems like uh, cattle instead of pets. It's it's again, it, it it's like this whole mental shift, right? Because most mm -hmm. of us treat our systems, you know, our servers and stuff like pets. Like we, we take care of them all the time. We log in, we do updates, you know, we carefully monitor their hard drives and stuff like that. We're in a lot of the modern enterprise environments, they treat them like cattle. So if that system has a problem, then they just tell the automation, fire up a new one and murder the old one and put this in its place. You know, it's like they don't mess around. And when you're going to do an application upgrade, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll say, all right, uh, from the uh, testing environment that worked well, provoke that up to, you know, like our you know, first you dev, that looks good, move it up to testing, that looks good, and then let's promote that into production. So it will stand up the new systems and then it will gracefully pull down the old like they never existed. And so you really, you just don't care about your servers anymore. And also something to think about too is say, for example, one of those servers gets compromised. What you can do is you can pull it out of production and set it in just kind of a little quarantine zone and then just promote something else in its place. And then you can go back and do some diagnostics on that server. Like what happened to it? You know, like mm -hmm. how did it actually get compromised? What went wrong here? So it gives you the ability to um, do stuff like that. 
right? You can just blow something away and put something right back in its place like it never happened. That's That to me is pretty awesome. Because think about to uh, disaster recovery, right? If something major hits this one data center, well, I can just shift my infrastructure over here seamlessly, like without even having to really think too much about it and just tell it, hey, start cranking resources over there. So we'll see a lot of people, what they do is they have a, a hybrid strategy where they have on-premises stuff, like in their own personal data center, and they're running most of their production out of there. And if anything goes wrong, they fire that stuff up in the cloud where it's more expensive to run their workloads up there. But disaster recovery, is it better to have your systems up and it costs you more to run them or to be hard down? So, you know, this, it gives you the opportunity to do that stuff a lot. So a lot of it's just uh, like really heavy cultural shifts in the way people operate inside their environments, I think. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes that's more difficult to get people to shift the way they think than it is to learn some piece of automation, right? To, to really oh. fully embrace that stuff. To change, it's called hearts and minds for a reason, Greg. <laughs> and a lot of that has to go top down, right? Like if, like if you really see the value of automation and it's making your life better, but you know, your manager and his manager aren't bought in, then nobody else in the company is going to embrace that strategy. And you know, it's just yeah, you just, toiling away. Yeah. I, there's been innumerable things that I have done in networks that I was the only one who used it and was the only one who would update it and was the only one who looked at that, whatever it was, um, for ever and ever until like somebody else was like, Oh wow, you can do that. That's so handy. How do I do that? And then it's like, Oh, well here, like you remember that email that I sent out <laughs> six months ago? Yeah. That one, here's your login. There you go. Enjoy. And that's sure. tough too, because say it's a system that becomes key to the operation and you're the only one that knows how to work on it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, yeah. the panic attack. I, I bet Zach, <laughs> I bet that happens to you all the time. Yeah. Cause I mean, Zach, you're doing a lot of automation stuff. So is that, are you the, are you the, the lone man on the Island talking to your volleyball Wilson or do you have help in that? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty much the, the lone wolf. Um, it, it's definitely stressful. Right. And I've, I have found kind of to Tommy's point, it's, I found it easier to kind of build something, put it out there and kind of just use it. And then people find out about it and then they start asking about it and they're much more likely to kind of actually grab onto it than, Hey, look at this thing I built you know, set up a whole meeting, demo it, you know, go, go through the whole dog and pony show and show, you know, everything that it does and how it works. And there's, I found there's much less buy-in from, from those sorts of situations versus building it, letting it kind of do stuff. And then just kind of organically, it works its way into conversation. And then people start asking questions. And I, I think a lot of it just has to do with getting people to think something was like kind of their idea or, or you know, that, that kind of mental piece of first, you know, somebody telling you, Hey, you need to go use this mm -hmm. now because we built it versus, Oh, that's really cool. And it, it kind of removes that, that barrier. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's... A lot of times if you can show them, right. Show mm -hmm. them how it makes things better as opposed to just tell them. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I can dig it. All right. That's well, it. you guys ready to talk about the new piece of hardware? 100 gig switching, 100 <laughs> gig switching. I'm so happy. So, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the one downside is um, I've been trying to find the switch or the switch chip um, in the, the, this new five, the CRS 504 has um, uh, Mellanox, which is now NVIDIA's. Um, what's the name? Um, I, I'm trying to remember what it what exactly it was, but uh, it does have layer three hardware offloading, but it does. There's nowhere, no documentation that I can find anywhere on the internet about how much, like, what are its capabilities? Like, can I do five thousand routes? Can I do you know two thousand NAT sessions? Um, you know, can I have fifteen ACL rules or fifteen hundred? 
Mm-hmm. Doesn't say anywhere. I'm assuming that it's probably not that many, just because it's um, uh, you know, it's a relatively inexpensive version of the um the melanite the the chip that it's using. Let's see where did it go? It's the 98 DX4310, um, which shows up as like a kind of a bottom of the l- a lower end of the line. Um of the 98 DX portion. Um, so, which is 16 X 25 gig, um, port non-blocking wire speed speed switch. Shift. So in theory, you could break this out into 16, 25 gig ports, um, or, you know, anything slower than that. If you were, um, wanting to be weird and crazy with breakout cables. Um, all right, we'll God. start with, start with just the, the port configuration oh. that it's got now. So it's it's 400 gig ports, uh, one Ethernet, one gig, um, which is just for management. Yeah, yeah. A console port. You get two re- uh, removable power supplies. This is the first switch that Microtech has released with removable power supplies that I can think of. But it also has a DC barrel jack and terminals. So like they have every power input that you could want. PoE in, uh, I believe, as well. Like this thing is. Like any way you want to power this, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Passive PoE, DC input, two pin per terminal, um, twenty five watt power consumption without attachments, up to forty one watts with, um, uh, with, I guess, one hundred gig SFPs, which yeah, up to forty one so, watts. That is nothing. Yeah, nothing. I, I've I've used light bulbs with more <laughs> power <laughs> usage. And you're mentioning those hot swap power supplies. They actually are front loaded, which I love. Like oh, I love really? having all this stuff right there on the front. Some people maybe not, but from years of working in a data center, I can really appreciate it when I don't have to like get in the back where there's that huge density of cables and stuff. I can just okay. Pull yeah, see, I've front. never liked front loaded power stuff just because it's like I want to remove as many cables from the front as I possibly can. Um, but I see where you're coming from. And yeah, where it's like a rack of full of servers because all the cables are in the back. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like how Microtech is like, this could be wall mounted by shifting the uh, brackets 90 degrees. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess it is small enough. But God, somebody who's wall mounting a 100 gig switch. I mean, yeah, I and mean, that's cool. Like they these these guys are... Obviously, Microtech is, is crazy because, like, who would think a four port switch would be like, oh, yeah, we want to make that? But four ports, 100 gig. Like, this is such a just cool little deal. Yeah. I love it. And you it. said it too. You could put a, a cable in one of the 100 gig ports and bring it out to uh, four 25 gig ports, right? Yeah. Um, and I was incorrect. It is only a 100 gig Ethernet or 100 meg uh, management port. Um, uh yeah and then the between the cpu which is just a qc um the q uh it's a mips be uh architecture it's a one core 650 megahertz so very slow uh, cpu yeah you do not want to be doing anything that's not hardware off this is a switch right this is purely a switch yeah yeah um (laughs) Uh, and it's router SV7, it looks like, V7 only, um, which it's completely understandable. I don't, I don't think you'd want to mess around with V6 stuff on this. Um, yeah, it's a Marvell Prestera switch chip. And it's just, golly, Ned, these things. It's so cool. And like the, what, what a lot of people are talking about is that this thing could be... Um, uh, really useful for building like a uh, ring configuration, a ring fiber, fiber ring sort of deal. And then just spitting out um, two ports of 100 gig to whatever is the downstream connectivity. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, with four like, ports, you've got one going east, one going west, and then you've got two to, to drop stuff off of. And it doesn't even have to be 100 gig. Like you said, you yeah. could split out, you know, have 100 gig and then 125 gig or eight 25 mm-hmm. gig ports that you're yeah. utilizing here. So, so, and the ports will do 100, 40, um, 4x, 25 gigabit, um, uh, 10 or one. So, like, you can 
basically plug in whatever the heck you want and downshift it or and and rock along insane amounts of bandwidth and then their direct their what their use case was or such was for the um some genomics data network project um which connects into the pan-european uh scientific network which is and you know that's they interconnect between stuff and are passing traffic as just a switch, which is just, this is such a crazy cool little thing. Um, and only, let's see, I think they were saying like 800 bucks for this yeah. guy. Street price yeah. about $800. Yeah. 800 Dirt bucks. Cheap. Yeah. 800 bucks for 400 gig ports. Like you can't even, I don't, I don't know even know if you can get hundred. Well, maybe gray market. You can probably, but like, 800 bucks for 100 gig yeah what a time to be alive <laughs> yeah what are we what are we well, doing with these 10 gig ports nowadays? it's also <laughs> for 100 gig for 100 gig ports for 800 dollars and it only uses fully loaded 41 watts of power i mean that's bonkers yeah i think if you I, were to get something gray market it's going to be ancient and it's probably going to be super power hungry oh yeah you're talking hundreds of watts at least like three four hundred watts i think for uh some of the junipers that i was looking at i was just like how do i battery back up this it's like dad so cool so cool so i'm gonna have 100 gig at all your tower sites now right (laughs) just because you can yeah uh, why would i do just 100 why not just do 200 gigs and, you know, you bond those suckers together. I want redundancy <laughs> with my speed. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, this thing is just I'm just so happy. Like you the the number of really cool little things that you can do. And then like if if this has any level of layer three hardware offloading for like a small network, if you were to do like a BGP like redundancy stuff and that's how you and you just use it as like a layer three router for interconnectivity like holy cow you can't like there's n- nothing that would yeah. uh, or maybe like um at a at an exchange use that as your interface into an exchange right where it's got some mm-hmm. hardware offloading but you don't need a, a ton you know to be able to do your filtering and accept some stuff in and out i could see that being really useful there too Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I think you can use that as a port extender, say off like the new uh, what is it, the 2116 too? Oh so add my more lord! Big ports to that guy. That would be brilliant. Oh yeah, and then and like if you're using it as like a port extender, it it'll still do the switching there. Mm-hmm. So man, yeah, you could really seriously build some cool some cool network stuff. Um, there was actually a discussion uh, from that, that we were having uh, a couple weeks ago with how Microtik was posting, uh, I think it was Normus or one of the other Microtik guys on the forums were talking about how you could use multiple um, hardware offloaded switches to take a full BGP table and have the full table be um, hardware offloaded by filtering out like you would just have a pass filter for okay this portion of the internet's ip space which would equate to around or something less than what the number of routes that the switch could handle and you would just scoot that down along and you could have like five or six different routers or switches that were hardware offloading different portions of the route table <laughs> which um i like had got everybody being like how the heck would you do that and it, there's you'd need you'd probably want like some sort of route reflector um rocking in there but it's like that would just be so cool to pull off <laughs> and, i'm also thinking if you had that many switches to be able to accomplish it you could probably just buy routers and save money yeah but but you have redundancy like built in <laughs> greg yeah, fair enough. Fair also enough. a ton of complexity, right? Yeah. 
complexity is complexity. That's why we have automation. <laughs> I think it's a fun, uh, a fun thought experiment. I don't necessarily know that I'd want to put it in production, but it's interesting to figure out, you know, yeah. around a problem. Yeah, it would be a really interesting way to solve a problem that we don't have at the moment. Just because well, you can doesn't mean you should, right? Yeah, that's right. Jurassic I Park. Love, Jurassic yeah. Park, bro. Yeah, yeah, we come on. You you <laughs> make it you you they made an amazing movie franchise by doing what they shouldn't. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the one lesson I learned was that uh you were so busy trying to figure out if you could do it. We never stopped to think if we should do it. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so while you're talking about port extenders, I saw somebody pop in. Man, I can't remember who it was, but they were saying that they were having issues with CRS-326. They had two of them. One was acting as a port extender, and they said that they, uh, I'm not sure if this was in production or if they were labbing it, and they threw a loop on the second switch, and it basically cratered the entire system. And they sent it to Microtech. They could reproduce, and so it looks like a bug. So it's just a, a word of caution out there. Yeah, I don't know if there's a lot. I don't know many people using the port extender stuff for Microtech um, just because it's really pain in the neck to upgrade and replace a piece of hardware when it goes, um, if something crashes or burns out. Let's say you know, your, your, your switch that you port extended to died. It's really hard to move the configuration over from that old switch to a newer switch and have everything stay the same. Um, there's no easy way to do a direct replacement, and there's also, um, uh, you know, you, you have the single head, the single point of failure of if the head no dies, then everything else is dead too. Um, which just, yeah, it really frustrates me. Like. If you're going to be doing that, it's really, really would be ben I I feel like it would be more beneficial to have some way of like, okay, I will have a dual head system or something. But I know that that's insanely complicated to build and create. Yeah, so, I usually think of like the port extender stuff as like that's one switch now. Like I don't really, in my mind, I don't separate them out as two. Just for mm -hmm. the the reasons you specified, right? It's like if you have problems with one, you're going to have problems with the whole thing and. So it's easier just to think of it as now this is one device. But having said that, I honestly don't know anybody else either that's using the port extender functionality. So yeah, I mean, it just seems like, well, you know, if I was going to do port, ain't maybe for some really complex environment, but that's why we created VLANs is so I can port extend. So it's like, <laughs> I guess I mean, what's the what's the idea of port extender? It's um. It makes the management plane simpler, theoretically. Yeah. You just connect you only it to the one, one device of, and you're making yeah. the changes there. So, yeah. So, and you know, you have that benefit, but now we're trying to do that with a centralized for the entire network with pure automation. Yeah. Um, it, most of the environments I've worked in have been so um, high availability that I was always way too terrified to not have like these little independent pieces in the network, you know, I, I didn't mm -hmm. want anything to have like cascading failures. Like I was just so terrified because I mean, you know, you, I didn't want to push one domino and then have <laughs> the entire rest of them fall over as well. Yeah. Um, speaking of dominoes and falling over, it looks like a uh, Rhetoris 7.2 has like 20 pages worth of fixes. Yeah. So I wonder how many dominoes of breaking we're going to have there. <laughs> so it's stable release, 7.2 yeah. stable. So Yeah, it's, supposedly. Uh... <laughs> that should just be rolling up all the fixes from what, yeah. what they've been working on, right? So it shouldn't be. That's what I've been seeing. Features. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen anything new in there. I've been following the testing release and running that on most of my hardware. Yeah. Um, but it's it's cool to see all the, the features and the fixes like listed out. <laughs> sequentially yeah. from uh the, the last day release to this it's as tommy said it's uh it's as long as you're on the list of stuff yeah yeah this is like the rap sheet my great grandpa had he was in an 80s rap group right 
<laughs> uh, no, uh, there's a reference as as a criminal, uh, and uh, exported from uh, the homeland for. Oh man, I always just assumed he was spitting spitting fire. Had those bad bars. <laughs> Well, uh, it would probably have been quicker if it was somebody who was wrapping it out. But yeah, like, so the last stable release of V7, v- V7 from Microtik um, was March 22nd. And that was 7.1.5, um, which was right after 1.4. Um, so in the 22nd, so that's what, nine days? Because there's 31 days in March, no, yeah, and plus five days, so in two weeks, effectively, we have just an insane number of updates and changes. Like, Microtech is working really, really hard, and working really, really fast. Um, yeah, they released 7.2 in December. And RC7 came out March 31st, so that it's stable. Like, that's two months' worth of work. Like, that's really impressive. Yeah, like, man, I think we're, it. yeah, I, we're, we are, it's been slow and it's been like really frustrating for a lot of people, but I feel like, you know, they're building something completely new. And I honestly, the more I've worked with V7, the more I've really appreciated some of the like changes to how BGP is being handled. Um, FYI, we do have the a way to see how many, um, you know, what we're advertising now in BGP uh, in B7, which was not available initially. Um, so if you're wanting to test out and learn more V7 BGP, it's now way less complicated and difficult to do. Um, uh, just a just read the patch notes for how to uh, do out, how to see what you're outputting. Um, I think something you said made me laugh. You said development is slow. uh, And I would say compared to the, what, five years we waited for version seven, I would say this development is uh, lightning fast. (laughs) How fast they've been putting stuff out. I mean, they're, they're, they're putting out uh, like the the train is moving really, really fast and people are fixing stuff. Like, I think we're going to have something that, a non insane person could use in a production environment um, relatively soon. Well, I mean, we, I, uh, there's people on the Slack using uh, version seven kit in production kind of in oh, yeah, all, I little, am. all areas of their network. I, I don't, I don't know where, but I know they are like to live dangerously. Yeah. <laughs> I too like to live dangerously. But do you have it as like your border router core piece or are you doing it on the edge? Where are you using it? So pretty, pretty much everywhere here. Yeah. Same. Rocking well, home. for my last job, we, um, we'd had it for our pops because we wanted to have cake and FQ codal. Um, and then we, one of the, the last thing I did before I left was, um, update our border routers, um, from 1036s to CHRs. And, um, what the, like really long discussion we had was, do we really want to keep uh, to have two separate router OS versions that we're mm. maintaining and, and running? Um, and it was decided like, nope, we're just going to have one set, one one router OS version that we're going to be running to simplify like what the heck is going on because um, it was really it, it it is disorienting bouncing between v6 and v7. Um, like just in how certain things are represented and, and worked with, worked on and how they, um, print stuff out or like, oh, Hey, you know, this one thing got moved over to here. Um, so, or this doesn't exist in V7 or doesn't exist in V6. Well, I mean, there Um, used to also be interoperability issues between like versions and six. I remember there would be like, if you were on X version and Y version, the OSPF wouldn't exactly work correctly between the two. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying that that's anything that's going on now or that's a recent issue, but I have seen it in the past. Yeah, and it's not imprudent to like just like consider that as an issue. 
um, as well. But yeah, we just decided we're let's just, everything goes to seven. Um, and it works for us because we have a relatively simple network layout and design. Um, and there's not, I'm not trying to do lots of tagging. I'm not, you know, a border router does one thing and one thing only. It does BGP and it sends default route out to the internal stuff. It doesn't firewall anything coming in or going out. It doesn't play any games. It's just stupid. Um, and then the pop routers, they're pretty stupid too. They and they do fil- they they do like filtering for customers, but they do queuing and BGP. That's it. Like I have very very much simplified what my routers are doing in the various aspects of the network or I had. And so it worked because everything was stupid simple and there was nothing that Microtik was doing that was complicated. Um, so, you know, as long as keeping things simple made things a lot simpler and, and made it so that things would be stable for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that made it less insane, but I would still not recommend like anybody, if you are not a insane and to spend hours and hours and hours every week learning, studying and playing around with Microtik insanity, um, I would don't do it because, you know, there's just not like, there's so many weird different things and you're not going to be able to Google search like you can for V6 issues. Like that's just not, not something that you can really do right now. And so, yeah, I, I've had it, oh, several people contact me about, oh, hey, I want to run it in my network. And I'm like, no, don't. You do not have the expertise to fix it when stuff hits the fan hmm. and you're trying to do complicated stuff. No, don't do it. I think that's the key word you said there was complicated. So I've been <laughs> running it in some simple applications and I've had really good success with it. But I, I think you're right. As you start getting more and more complex with your configuration, you open yourself up to more, you know, uh, more issues potentially, mm-hmm. especially, I mean, you think about it, Microtik can only test so many scenarios. They can't dream up all of the crazy ways people are going to use the equipment. You know I mean? They can't, they can't test for absolutely every tra- you know, crazy scenario. So mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Like I had a, I had a, test router that I tried to upgrade from V6 to V7. And it was like a router that I had just like done a bunch of like my training and screwing around with. And so I had all sorts of random config. That thing, every time I would up- try to update it, um, it would just straight crash <laughs> because, and, and just go into a reboot loop because the the upgrade script was like, I don't even know what the heck to do. So like I, the only way I was able to upgrade it was format it and then upgrade it. And that's where probably a lot of those people came up with like, oh, you have to, you know, if you want to go to V7, you have to wipe the config and everything. No, you don't have to. If you have a straightforward config or you aren't doing lots of goofy stuff, um, like putting pointing routes to non-existent uh, LTP, LTTP uh, interfaces. But like, yeah, just, just don't. It's not... <laughs> Unless you want to learn Microtik insane levels. I I think a lot of people take the stance of, well, I'm having all these issues. I'll just upgrade it, right? It's got to be a bug. It'll get fixed in the new version. It's like, well, that's not always a good thing because if it's something with the way you've configured it, all you're doing is just trying to bring that bad configuration into that new version. And maybe it's going to, you know, puke on that. Maybe maybe it'll transfer and you're going to have the same problem, whatever. It's like, no, get your stuff in a stable state if you can before you know, trying to move any of that and, you know, open yourself up to potentially more issues, you know, that, that aren't known yet. Right. Yeah. That, well, that also used to kind of be the default for Microtech support. Like one of the first things they would say is, are you on the newest version? You know, have you updated, you know, the, the router board firmware as well. And, you know, so it's like, well, you got to kind of weigh those things, but there is still stable trains of six. So if you're on six, you know, why not stick with the stable train of six as opposed to like jumping all the way to seven to see if that's going to fix your issues. Cause yeah. more than likely you're just going to introduce more complexity. So Zach, why are you running V7? Um, I'm kind of in that same boat, very, very simple networks, you know, routers are doing routing, switches are switching. 
Um, I, I wanted the the wire guard at the time and now zero tier. So kind of starting to play with that a little bit um, just for remote access, a little bit simpler than the, you know, setting up all the IPsec and, you know, X off and, and all those sorts of things. So for me, it was just kind of like convenience for, for some of those features. And because I've got that kind of simple layout, just like you've got, it, it's been really successful. Um, you know, I've run into one or two issues with like OSPF on a couple of devices. Um, but other than that, it's, everything's pretty much worked as advertised. I'm not taking like full tables or anything on my, on my BGP routers either. So that probably helps me a little bit. Uh, but yeah, just keeping that stuff simple and, you know, having the redundancy too. you know, being able to tolerate, Hey, I'm having an issue on this device. I'm just switch traffic over here uh, on a known good one. And I can figure out what's going on over here. So having some redundancy built into those systems as well helps. Mm. You know, something you know popping into the change log made me think about is <clears throat> i saw they had some x86 stuff in there you know and so when they're referred to x86 that's the ability to stall on you know bare metal you know you get an iso you install on bare metal and it makes me wonder how long are they going to continue to support the x86 uh install method and just that base and everything now that they have chr right the cloud hosted router that you can run on a virtualized platform so you could run it on you know was it uh, KVM or, um, you know, you can run it on VMware, you can run it in one of the cloud providers if you want to. So just, I don't know, does anybody actually install an x86 anymore? I haven't, I, I remember my first use of Microtik was actually on x86 stuff. We had BSD routers out of these apartment complexes where they were, you know, just like old desktops with that on. And it was a nightmare to try and configure those things. So, I mean, I, I, if Tom Smith ever hears this, you know, he'll send me a nasty letter, but you know, it's like you're, you're managing these, these config files and you have to restart services. And you know, you get a junior engineer in or somebody unfamiliar, that system is crazy. It's a nightmare, especially getting it off the ground. Um, but with the Microtech stuff, everybody can get into GUI. You can move around. It makes it so much easier. Uh, so I honestly haven't touched an x86 version in a million years. And I'm just curious, like, do you guys think there's still a lot of people using the x86 over the, because if you have a server, you could still install a hypervisor and do the CHR version, right? And to me, that's a really good path. So do you think they're going to continue to support the x86 stuff for much longer? I, I thought I heard something about them getting ready to kind of cut the cord on that. I, I don't, don't quote me on that, but I feel like I read something to that effect. Cause yeah, with CHR, I can't really think of a reason not to virtualize it at that point. I mean, if, you know, having the right hardware SRIOV and, you know, those features available to you so that you're getting the, you know, the throughput because of the, that virtualization layer that's in there. Uh, but if, if you have that sort of hardware, I mean, you know, you get lights out management. If you got to reboot it, you don't have to, you're not rebooting your whole server. It's just a virtual machine. I mean, you get, you get all those, you know, virtualization benefits. You can snapshot it. You can, mm -hmm. you know, back it up and everything like that, you know, as a full image versus, oh, I've, I've got this piece of hardware out there that I don't have, you know, any kind of lights out management to it or, or, or anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't deploy anything like that. Well, something else you yeah. said earlier is the idea how you guys are compartmentalizing functions on routers. If you're doing them virtual with CHR, that's really easy. You just spin up a new one, and now that's your border router. You spin up another one, well, this is my firewall. You know, So you could really compartmentalize all those pieces pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, no, and that was always a goal. So, especially with the speed of X. So I think the argument for x86 would be is if you had limitations on your hardware speed and you needed to squeeze as much as you could out of it, then yeah, a virtualization is always going to be some percentage slower than just running it straight on the hardware. But that said, you aren't running a Microtik because you need it to be insanely fast um, most of the time. <laughs> and if you need efficiency and speed, probably and cost, then you're probably just going to run, you know, a CRS or a CCR or a router yeah, board, so, you a know, router something board from, of some type. Yeah, you're going to, you know, just buy hardware straight from Microtik. 
I, I, I'm certain that there's still guys out there running x86. Um, like that just, it makes sense. Cause that's how we, that's how my, my old company got started running MicroTik as well as we had these Linux boxes in the operating system. Um, didn't have support for something or, uh, something just broke and they're like, well, let's just load this new MicroTik stuff on router OS and see how that works. Um, and that's they, they did that. And then we've been a MicroTik shop ever since for our, our routing. Um, and that really, but yeah, like nowadays, like I couldn't even, yeah, I, I think I, I just couldn't see a use case in any of the networks that I have worked on or in where I would not want the benefits of, you know, the virtualization if I were to be running something x86. I suppose yeah. if you have a bunch of hardware laying around or something, you know, that you're trying to piece things together or something. I mean, that, that is one of the, you know, beauties of Microtech, right? It's kind of that Swiss Army knife. You can throw in a lot of different situations, but, you know, with the cost of just a hardware router, you know, a CCR or CRS, I, I mean, you can't buy a server with that kind of throughput. I mean, look at the 2116, where they're like mm -hmm. three grand. I don't know that you can buy a server for that, you know, that price point to get the same kind of performance on it with, you know, with hundred gig ports and, you know, all that. It just, you know, cost wise, it doesn't make sense. And yeah, it, it's, it's tough for me to kind of fathom other than you're, you're kind of throwing something off in a corner because you just need something and you've got this piece of hardware laying around and you know, you're going to come back and replace it later, but to actually be actively deploying new, you know, production stuff that way, I, yeah, not, not a path I would probably yeah. choose. Sometimes when a product or a feature or something like that doesn't make sense to me, um, somebody will say, well, imagine you're in like some small country somewhere where you just don't have any money. Maybe you've got, mm -hmm. I guess in this scenario, maybe you've got like an old PC laying around and now this becomes my border router or something. Yeah, maybe that scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would, that that's that's the only thing that I could was think is you don't have any money and, you know, just, you know, the, you can spend your, you know, what is it, 60 bucks for a router OS layer four license, level four or whatever. And, you know, drop that in to, onto, you know, an old Pentium 4, something that's, you know, just been sitting there. I, I, honestly, like, I, I've seen some cool, some Pentium 4 computers that have just been chugging forever, and they never die. Um, and yeah. that probably just, that that seems like that would be your, like, a pretty reasonable use case in, like, where you're just, you know, you don't have any money for the hardware. You just need to, you need it and you need it to run and, you know, the, the management benefits it, I honestly, the, you know, we're discounting like, oh yeah, you get all these really cool benefits out of running, um, virtual, virtualized stuff, but like Proxmox, technically, if you're going to be using it in production, you should be paying for a license and that's expensive. Um, at least that's what they would like you to do. Um, you know, VMware, I don't know, I, I couldn't, I, I haven't explored it extensively, but there's not a great uh, low cost version. I think Hyper-V from Microsoft, you can get that, but I think that requires having Windows. So if I remember right, the, the core version of Hyper-V is you can use for free. So that would be kind of one one route. I've, I've got stuff running on Proxbox. I throw stuff in the cloud all the time, you know, CHRs. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, if that's what you got, you know, use it. I mean, it's better than nothing, right? Yeah. I, I think there's some driver type issues with some of that too, because it's still, um, you, you've got that hardware compatibility uh, stuff you got to play with. You know, you got this old Pentium 4 computer. Well, it's not using the latest, you know, Intel network cards <laughs> and stuff. You know, it's you know, whatever was out at the time. So I think you're going to run into a lot of driver compatibility stuff with, with that older hardware too. So it's, it's going to be a, a battle probably to, to get it up and running. It's, it's yeah. not as uh, you know quick to deploy and, and seamless. Yeah. And, and also you, 
adding in the virtualization is another layer of complexity that you know maybe some guy who's just trying to get something up and running just doesn't isn't going to want to try to do mm -hmm. like yeah i get all these benefits but now i have to learn proxmox or now i have to learn hyper v yeah. free version that yeah. doesn't have any gui and that's why i run rad rs because it has a useful gui to me if i can just install it on this piece of hardware i don't care that i lose some of these other things yeah so, yeah i mean fair enough a lot of well i would say most network guys aren't necessarily server guys mm -hmm. uh, although now that i've said that a lot of the folks inside the slack really do straddle that line pretty well um well so or at least way to. better than i ever did so <laughs> Yeah. Not necessarily uh, by choice, right? Yeah, not by choice. <laughs> I've been forced into this world. I hate you all. Mm, Why would yeah. you do this to me? I've cleaned a lot of toilets in my time. Not that I wanted to, but there you have it. So. All right. Let's move on to uh, a little thought experiment Miller had thrown out. So he does a lot of um, weird stuff. And so I guess maybe there was some kind of event scenario he was concocting in his head. The idea is... Uh, you wanted probably like as part of the event, you know, like part of the organization, they wanted to have somebody with a cell phone doing video. And I'm not sure why, maybe just so that it looks, you know, or maybe it like feels for experience wise, like, ah, oh, this is somebody in the crowd doing the thing, even though actually, I guess it would be, but they want to do somebody in the crowd doing cell phone video and they want to stream that back in. Here's the rub. It is a dense environment and five gigahertz, two gigahertz is shredded in, in those environments if you've ever been there. Uh, cell service usually goes to pot, right? It's, it's good for little stuff, but you're not going to be able to stream like HD video out of that place. So what do you do in that scenario to get cell service out? I kind of stole a little piece of his idea and built on that. I'm just curious what you guys uh, could envision happening in that scenario. So I looked at it and I, was, and I loved somebody's recommendation that one of the first recommendations was a USB-C uh, Ethernet adapter. <laughs> yeah, to a hardwired like, Ethernet cable. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, that would work. Um, so, yeah, a piece of copper is always going to be more reliable than uh, uh, wireless. Uh, until you have hundreds of people bouncing around. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, you're in the middle of a crowd. It's not that functional. Yeah. yeah, they do make military grade. You could really prove somebody's military grade. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Something I learned. So uh, at my time in the Grizzlies, they said, if you have anything that anybody can touch, even if they have to jump and touch it, they will destroy it. So you have to make sure anything you mount, anything you utilize is like at least... I think they said like six feet out of reach of anybody minimum. Um, I would be highly tempted to just do a very directional dish uh, and point it at where your person is and see, and then you have a effective cameraman whose job is point an RF elements horn um, at, yeah, ultra horn at, uh, at, who, where this dude is in the crowd and dude in the crowd has to wear like lots of glowy colory stuff so that it's easy to keep track of him <laughs> um, in the chaos. And that would be kind of where I would lean because, you know, you're just, you're going to cut out a lot of the noise from other directions. You're going to, you focus a lot of other stuff to, you're, you're going to have as, as high a gain antenna as you really effectively can. And, you know, that 20 megahertz wide channel, 5 gigahertz, I guess, pro yeah, is what you'd have to use. And just just roll with that. I I don't really see a lot of other... Uh, they, you know, people were talking about you could do the CBRS stuff, but... I guess depends on depends on the size of your budget, um, you know how far you can take this and how much time do you have to play around with stuff before you need to actually make this thing work. So I was thinking, and somebody mentioned sixty gigahertz, and I think you could probably do that. Have like a, a centrally mounted sixty gigahertz um, kind of sector uh, mm -hmm. AP, like one of those, and then if you're doing a, a team, like you said, you got a, a guy that's behind him. 
you could use that uh, USB to Ethernet off the phone and just uh, go back to a little 60 gigahertz radio that the, the guy behind him is holding and just kind of keeps it sort of zeroed in on that um, on that AP somewhere. And so that way, since you're not in the five gig, two gig range, you're not doing cell stuff. I mean, you should get pretty good. And these environments, I think pretty, pretty close. I mean, I don't think, I don't think he's talking about huge distances you're trying to traverse um, mm -hmm. with the signal. So I think that would be pretty good. That would kind of yeah, solve the, all the problems. Yeah. And your 60 gigahertz, you're going to be slow enough power that there's absolutely no issue being around people like that in, in that way. Like there's no, and you know, if you were to use microtech, once again, super low power, you're talking seven Watts. You can easily power that from a little battery bank for a couple hours. Yeah. Yeah. You could have a couple of booster packs and you'd be rocking and rolling for pretty much as long as you'd need to. You could even put uh, the AP up on a little, just a little stick, you know, that holds it maybe like a foot above the guy's head. Just so that, you know, as long as you're behind him, you're totally cool. You're out of vision. You're not going to see mm -hmm. it on camera. So that would, uh, I think that would be pretty light, pretty functional, pretty mobile. Throw a backpack think? with a pole sticking out the top with your access for your CPE on there, and then they can just wear it. <laughs> and your and your cords right there. Your cords not laying on the floor. You don't have some yeah. two people trying to stay together. Oh yeah, those environments can get pretty crazy. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. And they have you know, I mean, there's some beam forming in there, yeah. right? So it'll kind of keep it dialed in and you definitely have enough throughput. That mm -hmm. wouldn't be a problem at all. At that point, I would be highly tempted to just say, why are we using a cell phone? And with those junky cameras, let's, uh, let's give you an actual camera and, you know, a computer that's in your backpack also running off of a battery. And, you know, there you go. And now we have a professional level camera. We can just stream. We can use proper streaming software like yeah. uh, OBS or whatever. Yeah. And because they, yeah, like in the way. backpack, they could just have a little encoder that takes the mm -hmm. HDMI output, cranks it, and then fires it over the line. Yeah, I mean, pff, why not? Yeah, like that would be that. That would be kind of where I would lean um, on that direction. But I don't know. There's it's such a wide question. Like, okay, does it have to be a cell phone? Do I have to? You know, <laughs> how how inconspicuous are we trying to be? Because yeah. As you say, maybe, says cell phone, maybe that's like, part it's of it too. To be. Is so, that they don't necessarily yeah. know that they, you know, they don't want everybody to know that that's the camera. And if you're wearing a backpack with a pole and a radio sticking up on it, even if it's like a small, you know, like uh, one of those WAP 60s or whatever, that still mm -hmm. would be really bizarre to see somebody yeah. walking around with that. Yeah. Or suspicious yeah. at least, I guess. Conversation starter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, Mic micro tick evangelist. Yeah how how somebody's gonna meet their their wife what's that what's that strapped to your back well <laughs> let me tell you let me tell you something about crazy latvians <laughs> conversation um, starter icebreaker that's what that is yeah there you go your icebreaker um so they uh i speaking of crazy latvians um they also put out their latest i think they have a new um uh uh microtix uh what did they call it their newsletter um there's a couple other i thought 105 came out or has it has not not been officially released i thought it'd been leaked into the slack at least oh i didn't see it but that would yeah, be 105 yeah daniel the posted it would that be the one that's got this? Because uh, mm -hmm. we haven't seen one with the 504 yet, have we? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's newsletter 105, April 2022. Um, it hasn't hit the Microtix uh, official website yet, um, but it's nothing that we haven't seen before. We have the uh, the 504, which is the, it's the announcement for that. Uh, the LHG LTE 18 kit. Um, which could be another version way for hell. Like, Wait, no, it can't be. It's just a, the receiver CPE. Um, you have the CCR 2004 16 G two S plus PC. Um, so it's a passive cooled 2004, um, 
with the uh, Ethernet ports. So it's a 1009 replacement, um, which is super cool for a guy me who uses a boatload of 1009s <laughs> um they have the hot spot fan for the 2216 um and they've got their logo change which is like okay cool nobody cares yeah. <laughs> uh multicast igmp uh training deal white labeling for their IoT products, and they're changing the default LTE CPE's IP address. Um, blah, 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 blah. And some like cool stuff about what people have been doing with Microtik and then Microtik's um, donation to Ukraine. Um, they've been sending equipment down that way. Uh, and mass, I guess. So, um, yeah, 105, not released yet. If you just change 104 to 105, I think you can get the, uh, uh, in the, the link. I think that works if you were wanting to. Yeah, if you go mt.ld forward slash news 105. Um, let's see here. That should work. Let me just double check. Oh no, it doesn't. Haha! Uh -huh. so, In your face. It does not. It does not work. But if you are a Slack member, you do have um, access. You you could see this new cool stuff, um, and that is why you should support us. Is, <laughs> uh, we have all sorts of random people who are constantly attacking Microtech's website in hundreds of different ways so we can get <laughs> <laughs> the latest announcements of their products. <laughs> awesome. So. All right, man. Well, you put something about the Universal Service oh. Fund Administration Testing. I have no idea what that is. Tell me about that. Yeah, so if you get money from the from various uh governmental organizations so uh state federal um but so this is a uh, focus to connect america fund phase two phase two auction um alternative connect american FOSS, cost model acam uh revised acam and acam2 uh calf broadband loop support so uh, rural broadband a lot of these different um, federal government programs to uh, help get broadband in rural areas. Um, uh, a lot of these programs are replacements for the old systems that uh, telcos would get. So my old job, we were a co-op, um, a telephone co-op. And so we were, uh, this was so uh, something that affected us. Um, if, But what I'm seeing is a lot of the um, state level um, funding systems. Um, so like states have grant programs as well for getting broadband in rural areas or um, broadband in uh, or people who are less uh, connected. Um, they are starting to implement this as well. The states haven't been implementing it at the same level or as the way that the federal government is wanting because they just don't have the ability, they don't have the knowledge and or ability to take the information that feds are doing. But um, there's, I've been seeing more and more people having issues with this and, and or like, oh, I'm doing my grant, how do I um, support this? Um, the Universal Service Administrative, I have a link to it. They have their performance testing requirements, how it works, what those requirements are um, and how to do that. Uh, and then as well, uh, a bunch of like companies that are certified for being able to do that testing uh, for you. Um, because while you can self implement it, uh, it is difficult and expensive and not worth the time. You can, there's several companies that have really reasonable pieces of hardware that you can just do like boom, spit this out and it's done. Um, so just as a heads up to, I'm seeing more and more posts on Facebook um, and various other places um, that, hey, if, if people don't understand how this works or how to get it, this link will give you, it's all run through USAC 
um, and they're going to be able to, they're going to give you all the information that you're looking for. And so, so just as a quick little heads up for people, um, if you're getting government money, this is probably going to be a requirement at some level for you. Um, so pay attention to this and, um, you know, just as a, hey, here's how you deal with this. No, very cool. Very cool. Information sharing. I, I'm sure, I'm assuming there's a lot of, a lot of info on there, huh? Uh, so the uh, original testing document was like 45 pages long and it's only gotten longer. Um, <laughs> and because I was like the guy who had to implement it into our system, like it was like, ah, oh, frick, this is going to be so painful. And so I, I had to kind of figure it out. And cause I was, I was trying to do it using Microtik CPE. Um, and I've got some levels of it working, but it was never a good system. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've worked on it on a couple different networks with people and, um, there's lots of different uh, ways of going about and making it um, rock um, and a lot of different companies out there for doing that testing um, mm -hmm. and what that re requirements are. Uh, so yeah, th there's information, lots of really good information here um, and they have a set of vendors. And so far I've worked with four, three or four different vendors in this list and they've all been really good. Um, uh, I've, been really happy with the uh, advanced technology at go something yeah advanced technologies and services um, those guys have been pretty good um, that's cool pretty and I like the idea of um, using another company that also pushes the liability on them it's like yeah oh, we had these officially certified people come in do everything like yeah. I'm good if any, there's any blowback mm -hmm. you know at least yeah, I you, kind of CYA yeah it well it's CYA and um, like there, it's, there's just a, like, you have to be, t you can't be testing from one point in your network to another point in your network. You have to test back to, that's the like big thing. That's the difference of what this one is, is you have to test to a FCC certified location. So like for us in Colorado, we have to test from our network to Denver because that's where connectivity and like everything is. Um, and like, if you're in, I don't remember in, in Illinois, it's going to be to Chicago, but like you have to have hardware in a certified data center. Like this is where there's a lot of other connectivity and where people's internet is actually going to want to go, which I think is a brilliant move by the FCC to like, no, you can't just test across your network. You have right. to, we have to test the whole connectivity line. Um, uh, there's, they're also requiring like certain speeds, like you have to hit these certain speed qualifications and you have to hit latency, which is just beautiful. Like so many times we've just been like, oh yeah, we hit speeds, all this, blah, 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 blah. Um, like latency is so important, um, nowadays too. And like, there's a lot of different stuff and, um, you can really see like, all the different ways that the companies that are commenting on, Hey, how do I get this? You know, or the FCC is like, Hey, we want to do this. And the companies respond with, well, but that's going to be really hard. And it's like, well, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> we want you to actually, you know, prove that you're doing, you're doing what we're paying you to do. Um, which I like, like government, if you're going to be getting money from the government, you should be held accountable to doing what the government is paying you to do. Yeah. So long as what they're telling you to do is reasonable. And it sounds like in these scenarios, they pretty much are reasonable. So yeah. So well, I don't care if it's reasonable or not. If you're taking the money and you're saying you're going to do it, you oh, should do it. Make sure you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't in care. Like, respect, if the FCC, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if, if you're going to just take money to take money from the government, well, I don't have any respect for you. Like <laughs> I, that, that the FCC wants you, if you're going to get money and Universal Service Fund says, if you want this money, you have to do this. Well, okay, you have to do it. I don't care if it's unreasonable or not, or if it's yeah, If it's feasible. unreasonable, just don't take the money. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, absolutely. Like, you don't so many people it. are like, but I want my money and I don't want to have to do anything for it. No, <laughs> that's the point. 
<laughs> Stop shaming me, Tommy. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I, I've, I've had too many discussions with people about like this is so hard, and I'm like, but that's the point. Is you're supposed to be doing this. <laughs> You're paid to do this by mm. somebody. That it's the government doesn't mean that you don't have to do it. <laughs> mm. You look like you have something to say, Zach. What's on your mind? Oh no, I was I was just kind of in agreement. You know, as, as far as you know, if, if you're going to promise you're going to do something and and just following through with that, especially when you're talking taxpayer dollars, you know, we're 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 all paying for that, right? So if you're going to you know, without getting too political, that's uh, you know, kind of the Hey, you're you're getting this money. There, there's uh, you know requirements associated with that, and if you're not going to fulfill those, then you shouldn't get the money. Hmm. Pretty cut and dry. I yeah, can dig it. All right. Well, I tell you what, we're uh, we're at the end of the list. We're bumping up on time. Is there anything particularly uh, interesting or important that uh, we didn't say that you guys need to get out into the world? No, I don't no. think so. I want to. I want to say congratulations, Tommy, for your uh, your new interesting move. I hope <laughs> things uh, continue to be uh, interesting for you. I know you're always uh, looking for a new challenge. So, good luck, bud. Oh, thank you. All right. So, so Tommy C. If people out on the internet want to get a hold of you, I know you've been extremely busy lately. But if they wanted to just say hi, not ask anything of you, how would you have them do that? Oh, just say hi. Well, you should uh, join the Brothers with Slack <laughs> and uh, uh, be a Patreon and support us um, and uh, say hi there. If you're looking to uh, ask me about, you know, USAC filings or how to do broadband grant stuff or just general network issues and such, I'd be more than happy for you to reach out to me at uh, Tommy at Lost Creek dot tech um, that goes directly to me. Um, I'm also on the Mimosa forums as, uh, oh, I think I, yeah, I, um, I'm no longer William five there. I'm something else, uh, because William five was my old company's stuff. Uh, Tommy something or another Tommy three. Um, you can reach out to me there. Be more than happy to help you on the forums and answer questions. Uh, I love helping people, uh, there and making things better. So if you uh, want to reach me at any of those places, be more than happy, be, feel more than free to do so. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Zach Biles, if you want people out on the internet to interact with you in some way, or you could, I mean, say, no, don't interact with you. That's also a valid answer. If you would care for them to, how would you, uh, how would you have them do that? Uh, you know, best way is probably through the, the Slack. Uh, I mean, they're, very, fairly active. And, uh, I do a little bit of blogging on the side, uh, zachbiles.net. Um, there's a contact me there. If you feel the need to say something to me that you don't want to say in the Slack. So <laughs> have at it. But not only his blog, but, uh, I would recommend you follow his GitHub because he's got a lot of really good, um, automation stuff in there. If that's your bag, there's a lot, there's a lot of really good material in there. If you want to find me, I'm Greg at gregshole.com, or you can just go to gregshole.com where I very regularly blog again, um, if you guys have any questions or comments, you can fire them that direction. Uh, we have a brother's wisp link. I mean, all that comes to my same email account. So it's like, just, just use that one. Um, if you guys, uh, have any interesting topics you want us to cover, I know somebody said something about, let's talk about guy wires on towers at some point. And, uh, maybe we'll add that to the next one. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely listening and we are responding. So, uh, let us know. Thank you, uh, Tommy. Thank you, Zach. And thank you listeners. We'll see you guys next time. I will click stop.